Today we have a look at Interflug, the East German national airline. How long did it exist? What was special about it? And what types of planes did it have in its fleet? In this video I'll bring you the answers to those questions and many more Interflug facts on top. Hi and welcome to another East Germany investigated video. If you're new to the channel, this is the only dedicated East Germany YouTube channel in English. We talk about the former country's biggest secrets, we unravel myths and share facts that you may not have heard before. Let's get started. In order to understand how Interflug came about, we have to go back to 1926. In April of that year, the German national airline Lufthansa was founded. During World War II, Lufthansa was incorporated into the Reichsluftfahrtsministerium, the Reich Air Ministry, and actively participated in warfare. After Germany lost the war, the Allied Control Council, made up of the four powers that now govern Germany, issued a number of new laws, orders and directives between 1945 and 1948. As part of the denazification, law number 34, published in August 1946, dealt with the dissolution of the Wehrmacht. This included the German Air Force, which meant that Lufthansa had to be closed down along with it. It wasn't until 1955 that Germany was allowed to operate its own airline again. But in the 1950s, Germany was already divided. Two German states had been founded in 1949, each with its own government. The result was that in 1955 both countries independently recommenced civilian passenger flights and they both revived the old pre-war name of Deutsche Lufthansa. West Germany, however, was the first in registering Deutsche Lufthansa, which it did in 1954, one year before East Germany did the same. At a time of growing political tensions between East and West, West Germany did not want to be associated to the East German airline of the same name that they didn't have anything to do with. The GDR realized that they most probably would not win the upcoming court battle, so as a precaution, in September 1958 they founded a second East German airline, Interflug, which started as an air charter company. It wasn't until 1963 that all activities of the East German Lufthansa were ended and were absorbed by Interflug. Interflug now became the national airline of the GDR, but next to this, Interflug also ran East German air traffic control and managed the airports. There also was an agrarian sector and Interflug carried out industrial and photographic flights as well. I'll come to those activities a bit later on. Throughout the existence of the GDR, traveling by plane was something that ordinary East German citizens rarely did. First of all, the number of destinations was limited because they were not allowed to simply take a flight to, let's say, Amsterdam. Only locations in the Eastern Bloc were available. Secondly, flying was expensive and nothing like today's budget airlines. This was reflected in the number of Interflug destinations. In the beginning, there also were a number of domestic destinations. Dresden, Erfurt, Leipzig, Bad and Heringsdorf. But with improving road and railroad conditions and rising fuel costs, the domestic flights became less and less attractive. In 1980, they were discontinued. Being a crew member at Interflug was a great privilege and a dream for many East Germans. There were of course thorough background checks by East German state security, the Stasi, and if they found anything in your private life that was not compatible with East Germany's socialist values, you would have no chance of a job there. You had to be politically reliable and ideally also a member of the ruling Socialist Unity Party. If you had relatives in West Germany, your chances of a career at Interflug were small. And even if you did become a pilot or flight attendant, where you were allowed to fly was defined by the so-called three reliability categories. SW stands for Sozialistisches Wirtschaftsgebiet, the socialist economic area, which meant the Eastern Bloc states. NSW, nicht socialistisches Wirtschaftsgebiet, the non-socialist economic area, which meant the countries that the GDR was trading with. And the third category was KA, kapitalistisches Ausland, capitalist countries. When starting as a crew member, you would only be allowed on SW flights. And if you did a good job, 
and additional thorough background checks did not come up with any irregularities, you would be allowed to fly to the rest of the world after a while. But you could never be sure if you would be one of the lucky ones. Being able to travel to Eastern Bloc destinations like Moscow, Budapest and Sofia as a crew member was in itself a dream come true for many. But it was hard work, especially at the beginning, with several flights a day, no trolleys to take around the food and drinks, lots of turbulence and much more lavish service than today. In the mid-1950s, the first plane used was the Ilyushin IL-14. This plane had only a limited number of passenger seats, no more than 32. The East German Lufthansa, as it was still called, got its first batch of planes from the Soviet Union. But at the end of the 1950s, the GDR was able to produce a number of IL-14s under license in Dresden, which it did quite successfully. The Antonov AN-24 could carry up to 48 passengers and was mainly used for domestic flights. Unlike elsewhere in the world, in East Germany the plane never proved to be very popular. The Ilyushin IL-18 was the most popular interfluke aircraft. It had up to 100 seats and with its longer range, flights to the favorite destination of Moscow, for example, could be made without a stopover, which was a huge efficiency improvement when it was introduced in the 1960s. The plane was renowned for its high level of flexibility. It could even land on unpaved airstrips, which made it ideal for special missions. Interfluke had IL-18 aircraft from 1961 till its end in 1991. None of its other aircraft had such a long service life. Some of the IL-18 aircraft still exist today, used as a museum, restaurant or training location. At the Hans Grade Museum in Borgheide near Berlin, you can find an IL-18 that originally was a gift from Khrushchev to Ulbricht in 1962, to be used as a government plane. After a few years, in 1964, Interfluke started using it as a regular passenger plane. The IL-18 in Borgheide is, as I was told, the last and only IL-18 that is still complete and in its original state. It is visited by a lot of ex-crew members. I was told that until recently even former Russian crew members used to visit the Borgheide Museum because even in Russia none of the planes have survived in this form. Unfortunately, the plane needs repainting. If you want to visit the museum or help the people who run it to buy a tin of paint or a few brushes, I will leave the link in the description. The Tupolev Tu-134 was the first jet airliner at Interfluke. In 1968, the first ones were flown in from Kharkiv, the second largest city in Ukraine, where they were built. The Tu-134 had up to 96 passenger seats and the first versions were characterized by a glass nose. Another Ilyushin plane, the IL-62, arrived in East Germany in 1970. With a range of 8 to 10,000 kilometers, it was the ideal aircraft for long-haul flights to other continents, which was exactly what was needed at a time where more and more countries were recognizing the German Democratic Republic as an independent state. With its 168 seats, it was also the aircraft that could transport most passengers. Because the planes all came from the Soviet Union, during the introduction phase of a new plane, the pilots were mostly Soviets, while East German pilots were still in training. And to tell you the full story, there were a number of Interfluke aircraft that were not used as regular passenger planes. They were operated by the East German Army or by state security, the Stasi, and used for their often secret missions and for the transportation of the GDR leaders. In order not to attract too much attention, most of them were branded as interfluke planes. An important reason was also that it was less complicated to get overflying permits for a passenger airline than for a military flight. Therefore, East German military often wore interfluke uniforms on their missions in these planes. Am I going to make a video about the NVA, the East German Armed Forces? Yes, I am. And after that long line of Soviet aircraft, at the end of the 80s, suddenly something unexpected happened. The GDR bought three Airbus A310 planes. In the 1980s, the world was opening and collaborations between East and West were becoming more common. 
1989, just before the Berlin Wall fell, the A310s with 208 seats went into service. The A310 would be the last and most modern type of aircraft that Interflug would ever own. As mentioned earlier, Interflug also had an agrarian branch. Its fleet mainly carried out sowing and fertilizing activities. The fleet was made up of the following aircraft. The Arrow L60, a Czech aircraft used for crop dusting. Also a helicopter, the KA26, was used as a crop duster. The Let Z37, Chmelak, which means bumblebee, was another agricultural aircraft which was later replaced by the Polish PZL-106 and the PZL-M18. For interflug surveying and industrial activities, the Antonov II and the Let L410 were used, but also the IL-14. In addition, the helicopters Mil MI4 and later the MI8 proved to be very useful. Unfortunately, Interflug aircraft were also involved in a number of accidents in which people lost their lives. In fact, the deadliest in Germany to date was the crash of the Interflug Ilyushin IL-62 on August 14, 1972. Flight 450 to Burgas in Bulgaria had just taken off from Berlin Schönefeld when the crew reported a problem with the elevator of the plane. It began to turn back to Berlin and dumped fuel. But then the crew spotted a fire in the back of the plane and a few minutes later the plane crashed. The subsequent investigation revealed that the cause of the crash was a leaking hot air tube which caused a short circuit and a fire that weakened the whole tail section of the aircraft which finally broke off. 156 people died in the crash. Low-cost airlines, as we have them today, did not exist before the 1990s. But in fact, something similar did already exist in East Germany since the 1960s. For the GDR, obtaining hard currency was vital to its survival. But given the trade restrictions with Western countries, this was not easy. Many West Berlin tour operators, however, chartered Interflug for their holidays to sunny destinations in Southern Europe, because Interflug could offer lower prices and for West Berliners, traveling to East Berlin's Schönefeld airport wasn't much more inconvenient than their own Tempelhof or Tegel airports. For over two decades, this was a very lucrative business for the GDR. In 1990, in the months before German reunification, there was an optimistic atmosphere at Interflug. The world had opened up, which led to more destinations and more customers. However, it was a loss-making business. The plans of the West German Lufthansa to acquire Interflug were blocked by the German Federal Cartel Office. And in February 1991, the Treuhand, the organization that had to sell all the East German companies, decided that Interflug should be closed down. The reason given? No buyer found. On April 30th, 1991, Interflug operated its last flight. The last scheduled flight was from Vienna to Berlin by a Tupolev 134. There are many opinions and theories around the end of Interflug, but at least two things can be said here. First, after the end of the GDR, the Treuhand, who sold off GDR companies to the highest bidder, did not always run things as well as it should have. Second, if Interflug had survived, it most certainly would not have been as an independent airline. Its market position, given its outdated fleet and inefficient cost structure, was not attractive to any buyer. After 1990, the former East Germany was not a low-cost country anymore. With the end of Interflug, almost 8,000 people lost their jobs. 1,000 of them was able to join Lufthansa. A small group of Interflug employees started their own airline. They were able to take over five of the IL-18 planes. Under the name Berlin, the company was able to make many flights. Given the versatility of the IL-18 planes, they didn't only do passenger flights, but also UN missions and transport of animals and industrial equipment. After two years, they even leased two extra planes. However, it turned out that Berlin was not able to operate profitably. And so, at the end of 1994, they had to pull the plug. 
Interflug certainly was one of the prides of East Germany. For any country, having its own national airline is a sign of sovereignty and independence. That purpose was well and truly served by Interflug. But like so many other East German companies, it was not able to survive after German reunification. I can recommend an interesting book about Interflug, which is available in English. It discusses the topics of this video in more detail and has some other interesting chapters, for example about a plane designed and constructed in East Germany and anecdotes from former flight attendants. I'll leave the link in the description. That's it for today. Want more East Germany videos? Check out the channel. Thanks for watching and hope to see you in the next one.